In our last session, we considered the basic MBSE layered approach. We talked first about the traditional process and then moved to a discussion of the layered approach. As an example of that new MBSE process, we are going to consider a problem that is every bit as old as military maneuvers. In order to highlight the aspects of this problem that we want to consider, we will first examine a solution from about 100 years ago. We will then approach the same problem with the same conceptual solution and simply update the technology involved. So let's turn first to the old problem. The picture here is of a World War I trench in France. Still visible across the battlefields of Europe, these trenches were dug by soldiers on both sides of what was then known as the Great War. The trenches enabled the soldiers to move back and forth under relative cover. They were effective for what they were designed to accomplish. They hid the soldiers and their movements from the other side. This meant that each side developed a need to know what was going on behind this cover of the network of trenches. Since a view of the deployment and movement of the enemy troops within their trench system could not be had laterally across the battlefield, it was necessary to exercise the technology of the day to obtain a view of the battlefield from above. This was accomplished by uniting two relatively new technologies airplane flight and photography. Biplanes carrying photographers equipped with box cameras would overfly enemy emplacements and return with exposed photo plates showing the enemy deployment. This solution was organized into a system that allowed the headquarters to request the needed photography which could then be obtained by the biplanes. My grandfather was assigned to a photographic unit that was at the heart of just such a system. He is pictured here in France in his uniform during the war. Beside him is a cartoon version of their unit operations. In the cartoon drawn by another member of his unit, you can see the planes returning from their photographic missions. The photographers package the photographic plates and then drop them from the planes attached to parachutes. The plates were retrieved by messengers on motorcycles with attached sidecars. They were taken to the mobile photographic lab for de development and printing. The finished prints were then conveyed to the headquarters by motorcycle. This form of a reconnaissance system provided headquarters with the needed information about troop placement and movement. For our convenience in translating this system into the modern day, we've created the generic la labels for the elements of the system. The airplanes we have labeled as image collectors. The photographic lab is the image processing system and the headquarters is the customer. The motorcycles form the interfaces between the image collectors and the image processing system as well as between the image processing system and the customer. Taken together, these made up the reconnaissance system in use on the battlefield in France in World War I. As an aside, it's interesting to point out that this is perhaps the very first DODAF OV-1. However, to be technically correct, it cannot be a DODAF OV-1 since there was no Department of Defense at the time. It was known instead as the Department of War, making this a DOAF OV-1. Let's take a closer look at the elements of the World War I reconnaissance system. As we said, the customer is the headquarters that needs pictures of the area behind enemy lines. These images are collected by the biplanes carrying photographers. The raw images are processed by the photographic lab and then shared with the customer as an answer to its needs. The interface that transports the exposed plates to the lab is the motorcycle that collects the dropped plates and delivers them. Other, likewise, the interface that delivers the printed pictures to the customer is again the motorcycle. 
The operation of the system is depicted here. Biplanes return with the images, drop them to the motorcycles that take them for processing, and then convey the finished product to the customer. We have labeled the elements as they will be labeled in the updated system that we will use as our example. The fundamental process of obtaining images, processing them, and conveying them to the customers will remain substantially the same, but the technology will be radically advanced from this. The problem to be solved is almost exactly the same as well. The customer needs to see beyond what they can observe laterally at ground level, but in our case, the scale will be dramatically widened. The use of the personal example is to underscore the advance in technology and the widening of the scope in just two generations. As promised, this example reflects the widening scale of the need for imaging. No longer is the need to see what lies hidden from view, but within rifle range, but to understand a much broader battlefield. Technology is both the reason and the solution for the greatly magnified needs. Given the similarity and relevance of the underlying problem, we will avail ourselves of the opportunity to cheat a little by adopting essentially the same solution. Rather than involve a true investigation of the problem space and a creative exploration of the solution alternatives, we will adopt the essential solution that we have seen in our World War I example and simply update it as we build a model. Here we see the correlation between the old solution and the solution that we will model. We are using new symbols to represent the elements. These symbols represent the updated technology. The interfaces will be electronic in our new system and are not as tangible as the motorcycles of the old solution. However, they are every bit as real and present in the new solution as in the old. We will turn first to the boundary definition at the highest level. This will define the space within which we will design. We have discussed earlier the dangers of designing without a clear idea of where the boundary lies. Neither failing to design completely inside the boundary or crossing over it into the context space can lead to anything good. In our example, the determination of the system boundary turns largely on who is asking for its creation. This is because the ownership of the system space is determined by that consideration. There are several possibilities here. In one instance, the request for an image management system might come from the owner of a collector or a group of collectors. In another, the design project might be at the behest of a customer or customers. And finally, the system might be the brainchild of some enterprising party or government agency seeking to establish an exchange space for images being collected and distributed to customers. In each case, the purposes and span of control may well be different. These bear on the boundary determination and must be considered at the outset of the design process. In the first instance, the design is being commissioned by a collector or collectors. The design customer owns the collection system and will be able to allow it to lie within the design space. The design team can modify or shape it to the extent possible to accommodate the aims of the project. The customers are a different story. In this scenario, they are beyond the design authority of the team and lie outside the boundary of the context space. The designers will not be free to redesign their behavior or technology, Steve Jobs and Apple aside, but must set up their system to interface with them across the boundary. This customer likely wants a way to increase efficiency by managing the images as they are captured to promote distribution and reduce the recapturing of duplicate images. They will likely want some sort of image library with a catalog and the capability to interface with the customer 
for taking image requests and distributing the images retrieved or captured in response. In the second instance, we are approached by a customer or a group of customers wanting some system that would instantiate a way or ways for them to obtain the images they need. The situation with regard to span of control is essentially reversed. The customers can now be considered to be within the design space, inside the border, while the collectors are outside the boundary in the context system. This changes the design task, making it necessary to accommodate the collectors across the boundary instead of the customers. The customers are likely seeking a way to efficiently obtain images from the collectors and to store previously ordered images. They will probably require some kind of an image library and a way of communicating with collectors to obtain the images. The final case finds an enterprising party seeking to create a system that will match image requests to existing images or collector task orders for new ones. In this case, both collectors and customers are across the boundary in the context system. The new system will have to be designed between them with interfaces to accommodate interaction in both directions. The sponsor of this project will likely want to be able to obtain, retain, and manage images for distributions to customers. The design will likely require an image library with catalog and retrieval services, as well as a communication capability that will manage the communication between the system and customers and collectors alike. This case is the one that we have chosen for our example. We will consider it as we move on to explore the various domains and levels of the design. We have laid out an example with which to demonstrate the process of layered MBSE. We are skipping the iterative creative steps of choosing a solution so that we can focus on the process of working in each domain. We will call ourselves out for jumping to solution here but we can, can't do everything in one tutorial. In our next session, we will begin to elicit and manage the requirements.